from Hollywood, it's the Jerry Lewis Show with Lou Brown and a band. And Jerry's special guests, Frank Sinatra and Suzanne Summers. Hello. My name is Cary Grant. Yeah, that's me, Cary Grant. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you a friend of mine who is so funny. You know, there's an old saying that the world is a comedy to those who think and a tragedy to, to those who feel. And I say, oh yeah, hmm. But this man I'm about to introduce to you, it, when he sings, <laughs> the whole world laughs. He's about that tall, he's got a little doggy, he makes people laugh, I love him dearly, and, and you're, you're gonna go flip. He does Gunga Din better than Gunga Din. Oh, you're gonna laugh when you see this man. Well, I hope you will, yes. Will you get on with it? Jerry Lewis! much a pleasant good evening to you welcome to our show we've got a terrific show for you we think that we know you will think it after you see it did you ever live in this lifetime and say to yourself we take things for granted right all of my life I'm living 58 years and all of my life I'm looking around I'm seeing things they're interesting I have a voracious curiosity I see things that are marked like peanut brittle Peanut brittle? I don't particularly care for it. I don't need it. You look at it and you pass it. You see something else that says it's a Sony. It's a this or that. You recognize that. When you get something like peanut brittle, you open it. Ah ha! Ah ha! I never knew that was in there. Over the years. <laughs> What'd you expect, Norman Vincent Peale? This is what you're gonna get. You know what? I love the voracious curiosity of an audience. Uh, last night, or the night before, they were firing questions at me. And I thought to myself, self, if people, if people are so curious about what's happening in our business, or for that matter, the lifestyle of a famous Jewish movie star, why shouldn't you ask? Why shouldn't you ask and why shouldn't you be told? I'd like to think of myself as a totally introspective, honest man. If there's anything you want to rap about, in terms of our business or myself, whatever, please feel free. Anything that you would like to talk about. We have microphones set up in the audience. You can walk on, be on television. Look at the queen for a day all over again. <laughs> Any one of you that would like to just, you can just stand up where you're seating, where you're seated, where your body is. <laughs> Anything you would like on any subject, no matter what. I know about everything there is to know relative not only to our business, but life itself. <laughs> I've never seen a dumber group of people in my whole life that have no question. How do you do, sir? How are you? You left your Kawasaki outside, I see. Sure it is. How are you? Okay. What is your name? Chuck. You're kidding. <laughs> that was my mother's name. Where, where are you from? Where are you from, Chuck? Well, now from Hollywood. Now from Hollywood. Yeah. In other words, they... you would prefer that we don't know where you're originally from, is that? Originally from Northern California. Northern California, you moved all the way down to Hollywood. <laughs> yes. Get on with it, Chuck. <laughs> I just wondered uh, uh, how you felt about uh, being in the King of Comedy. I really enjoyed that and just wanted to know. Uh, I loved it. I loved being in it. It was my financial pleasure as well as a creative pleasure because I was working with De Niro, one of the finest actors in the world. I've it always... Was, oh, I'm sorry. I was, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I, was just no, gonna say, I really wasn't through, but if you have something, you can write it. I, I had something else to say, Chuck. <laughs> If I'm, in other words, let me get through, then you can go. All right, I'm through. Go ahead. No, I, I had one thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I just felt that you've always been very underrated in our country, and, and the, the people of France obviously know a good thing when they see it. Well, that's, that's right. what I You see, see, if you dig hard enough, you're going to find people with good taste. <laughs> Anyone at all, feel free, just stand or raise your hand. Really, it's really fun when you get into the things that people are curious about. 
Yes, yes, sir. Jerry, for a man who had a heart attack a number of months ago, you look fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. I feel marvelous. Everybody should have open heart surgery. <laughs> Because you don't smoke, you don't eat junk food. I'll never go to Wendy's again. I think we'll be sued, but I never go there because I used to eat all kinds of junk food and I smoked four packs of cigarettes a day for 43 years, and now I'm totally clean. I eat no bad food. I don't smoke at all. I, instead of smoking, I chew gum and I have candy drops. I'm going to get uh, lockjaw and diabetes, but my heart is in great shape. We have a marvelous show for you. Thank you for coming. We'll be back in just a moment. Hang in. It's all done with a small mouth. <laughs> I would like to introduce our musical director, my conductor for 34 years, Mr. Lou Brown, and the author. I'm delighted to present what is known as a co-anchor, co-host, your, uh, your right arm, uh, your man Friday. All of those wonderful things would never really say what he is. He is an infinite genius in comedy. And I am the biggest fan he has in our business, Mr. Get Charlie Callis. Yo, oh, you're hot tonight. Hot. Oh, hot. Hot. Yeah. I, why not? Isn't it fun to do this? It certainly is. Keeps us off the streets. Hot! <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Charlie, I don't know of anybody that does. William Buckley. William Buckley. Yes. I don't know anyone that does that impression. How about that? Okay, you... <laughs> okay, I'll do William F. Buckley. Yeah. But you got to do an impression that I heard you do in the dressing room, okay? All right. Like I wasn't set up. Who Truman, do you want me to do? Truman Capote. Okay. William F. Buckley. Talking to Truman Capote. Wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, uh, Truman... It always <laughs> amused me that when we talked about Spinoza as opposed to Voltaire. <laughs> and the meaning that as opposed to didacticism and the concomitant with going so far, the Christian religion as opposed to Jewishism is marred with such. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Furthermore, <laughs> I thought that maybe you could think and come upon a thing that way we'd all together be at one, as it were, with nature. Well, when I was writing in Cold Blood... <laughs> good, good, that's good, that's good. I, the guys in the prison didn't like anything that I was writing. So when I went back to New York, I told them all the same thing. <laughs> Would you please repeat that? Well, when I was writing in Cold <laughs> Good. <laughs> Woo. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, for me to make this announcement is very meaningful to me because uh, when you introduce somebody that's very special in your life, you want to do it in such a manner that nobody can ever pick it apart. And there's no way I can really do that. There's no way I can really say what I'd like to say other than we're proud to present a legend, Mr. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> If you're going to have a guest, have one. <laughs> Thank you for being here. 
thank you for showing up. I knew you would. And it's a delight to be with you like this. It's water. <laughs> you want Diet Coke? No. No, I don't blame you. I'm so delighted you could be with us, Frank. I'm delighted to be with you, Joe. You know that. And I hope that you have a big, big success with this uh, series you're going to do. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. think we will. Yeah. I think we'll How can you miss with this crazy guy here with you? <laughs> We're going to get him a rubber room in his own turnstile. <laughs> Frank, I don't think... I don't think that the public knows... It, it's almost uh, trivia, but you've never done a talk show. Nope. And if you take too long, I'll never do another one. going for you what a thumb. but that it's such a it's such a marvelous wonderful thing because I don't know that in all the years that we've been friends and it goes back a long time I don't know that people have ever had an opportunity to see you in this particular guise and it's terrific for them I really think so well I've I, I've never done it first of all I haven't had enough time to do a lot of things I wanted to do if I wanted to do a talk show yeah but um, and secondly uh, uh, I would feel stymied on a talk show. You know, all of, with all of it, my knowledge about show business or whatever, I would probably be quite stymied. You know you what see, I mean? I don't agree with that. Because well, we talk together, like in the dressing room, when yeah. we're on a plane, we're going to go and do a show, whatever. In all the years we've been together, you've never been stymied. And that's what these things are about. I think... Well, we're going to have a big audience in the airplane or in the dressing room. <laughs> oh, boy. It's just you and me, you know, cozy-like. <laughs> <laughs> true. That's true. I got to ask you a question because that's my role, okay? Sure. What do you think of today in our business in terms of young singers and young performers? Well, I think that the thing, the, the, the one point bothers me a great deal is the fact that the, the, uh, the singers and performers, but primarily singers because that's basically my, my business. And uh, I, I feel that uh, I'd like to see them get more places to where they can break in a little bit. Uh, you know, I notice from time, I read all of the music uh, publications and, and, uh, and newspapers about new groups that are coming along, new singers that are coming along, and suddenly, let's say that they do succeed quickly, and they do quickly, but, but there's no longevity. It dis they disappear for some reason because they're coming into the business so quickly. But you see, and, and, and uh, when you and I got into show business, and Charlie at the same time, we could work in clubs in different towns, small clubs, and get some uh, experience. Not some, a lot of experience. And I think that the, uh, a lot of the kids today are lacking that. And it's a shame that they're lacking it, because there's no, there's no way that we can see how far they can go, what, how, how, how much they can grow in what they do. Yeah. Because they're gone before we realize what, what their potential. I think George Burns said it brighter than I'd ever heard. He said, there's no well, place... Why did you ask me the question? <laughs> <laughs> what did George say about George? I never heard George say anything about that. George said kids have no place to be bad. Performers have nowhere to go to be bad, to be corrected, to be refined, to have somebody sit there and say, hey, do this as opposed to that. Well, that's essentially what I was talking about. Yeah, well, George has no brains. I never like you know. <laughs> he's from another world. <laughs> what did George say? You know, say? he's older than water, I think. <laughs> George said, uh, somebody said to him, what's it feel like being 87 years old? He says, I get up in the morning, I read the obit. If my name ain't there, I shave. <laughs> We've got a lot of things to talk about, but we've got also commercials. We have announcements to be made by the networks. You're going to hang there with us for a few minutes? Uh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> we may be back with a guest.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back with my guest, Mr. Frank Sinatra, Charlie Callis, and I want you to know what friendship is. There are a variety of uh, definitions of the word friendship, but I can best show you my interpretation of the word friendship by showing you something that I have in a scrapbook of mine that's dated March 1944. It was the year that all America was waiting for. It was the year that Frank Sinatra did his first film called Higher and Higher. It was the year that I saw Higher and Higher 67 times. Because <laughs> I was appearing at the Earl Theater in Washington on the stage with the film Higher and Higher. <laughs> There's the ad as printed in the Washington Post, 1944. Loosen up so you can see my damn name, Artie, for crying out loud, <laughs> which is uh, here somewhere. Dave Apollon and the Filipino boys. And there I am. You see it? Filipino boys. Yeah. Now, on stage, Jerry Lewis's impression, a smart satire on Frank Sinatra, had the audience applauding loudly. I did the impression of Frank as Frank and I looked somewhat alike. We were both 107 pounds at the time. <laughs> and I had the bow tie on, and I did all or nothing at all, the recording that Frank made with Harry James. And if it wasn't for that, I was out of the business. If the guy with the needle didn't show up, I was out of show business. <laughs> <laughs> what does that feel like, seeing that, after all these years? Terrible. Isn't that awful? <laughs> I'm sorry I kept it. It's disastrous. <laughs> Let me ask you about Pavarotti. I know you just did a super performance at Radio City Music Hall with him. Isn't he special? He's probably one of the, f the greatest uh, uh, vocalists I've ever heard in my life. Not probably, maybe the greatest I've ever heard. And I, I must call him a vocalist because that essentially is what he does for a living. Uh, there are many other fine tenors in the world, we know that, but uh, this man has... Uh, I've, I've done a lot of... Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time with him, I should say. And... Um, to watch him work is so effortless. I mean, absolutely effortless. And I, I'd like to tell you a story about a moment with Mr. Pavarotti. Uh, he came to see me one, one time I was playing at Carnegie Hall. And uh, at the intermission, he arrived at the intermission, and then we put him in his seat. And after the show, he came backstage, uh, back in the dressing room. And I said to him, I thought to myself, I didn't know that well yet, but I figured I'd take a chance. I said, uh, Maestro, I said, I would like to ask you a question. I said, I'm having a little trouble with uh, closing out the ends of, of phrases in the, in the sense of a diminuendo, uh, which means that if you get a note, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. Charlie? Be sure. <laughs> and you want to let it go, da, yeah, fall away like that. I'll know? show you how. I'll show you how it's done. No, no, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, he was listening to me, and I, I explained the whole thing to him, and I said, I wonder whether you could help me in, in teaching me how you just uh, get rid of the note uh, gently. He said, it's easy, you just close up your mouth. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> I'll tell right on the floor. You're just to close up your mouth. And here I was going to get a big dissertation about vocalizing, you know. Hit one line, that's all. That's marvelous. I never, I learned, never did ask another question of this man. <laughs> Let me tell you something that, that I have found in traveling around the country in the last eight years, since 76. Probably the, the most curious question from the standpoint of the viewer has been when Frank did your telethon in 76 and he surprised you bringing Dean on the show. Were you indeed surprised? Now you, Frank, know as well as I do mm -hmm. that it was the most magnificently kept secret in show business. I think so too, I really believe that. And if you look at the tape, you'll see your anticipation of what's happening, my shock at it happening, and yet the viewer, who we hope really acknowledges what we're doing, all believes that it happened as it did. Yeah, but that but was, you knew about it. Did I know about it? No, no, I can, I can guarantee that. We, we, we hid him in a locker somewhere. <laughs> he had just enough room to get his arm up like that. <laughs> oh, 
Pally. Oh, Pally. Come on. Oh. And when he called me Pally, and I said, he still don't remember my name. <laughs> And I tell you, so we didn't bring him on when we did. We left him in there. We would have carried him on. Right? The, the one thing I remember distinctly catching your eye and thinking to myself, as I was embracing Dean, you were right over his shoulder. I'm thinking to myself, dear God, if Frank doesn't give me something to say, God, give me a line. Something. And we're embracing. And if you remember, when we broke the embrace, I said, you're working? <laughs> It was like a gift from God, because you had to say something under those circumstances. Well, you must have brought, watched my lips, because I was saying that to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a very exciting moment that night, Jerry. Really yes, quite marvelous. Was. It was very touching. It was marvelous for the country, because I found that not unlike your career, so many of us grew up together, working together, watching you. So many people grew up with Dean and I in a period where there was great freedom of thought and we didn't have the pressures of the world. We were able to look at performers and things they did and identify with them. It was a wonderful time in the 50s and the 60s. And we literally grew up with so many people that were obsessed with, how dare you break up? You're screwing up my well, life. It's true. it's true. And it's amazing. How I'd heard it from many, many people at that time. You have people saying, what a shame. And why did they break up? I said, that's personal problems, whatever it might be. Exactly. I couldn't stand you anywhere, but... <laughs> I, I also have a picture of Frank and Dean and I at the Copa in New York, where you're wearing a fez. I don't know why the hell you were wearing a fez. It was a convention in town or something. Probably loaded or something like yeah. that. <laughs> you and Jack Eigen, Dean and I, and the next night, it was Dean and I, Jack Eigen, and Al Jolson. Oh. Great pictures in that scrapbook. Oh. That's not the other singer you did. Yeah, remember? He, he, he should have been with a band. He was also good. He never had the training with a band. <laughs> Let me tell you how lucky you people are. You've seen a first tonight, not only in television, but you've seen a first that you had time to share with a marvelous, beautiful human being and my dear friend, Mr. Frank Sinatra. Thank you, Frank. about the band when Frank was there? I was noticing that the musicians in the band were all looking at Frank like this. <laughs> we were all looking at Everyone. Frank like that. What is it? What is it about? It's a charisma. It's a char it's his ca it's his nature. <laughs> he has the he has the kind of remember we all grew up with Frank. Yeah. We all grew up with a man who did all the things that we would but for the lack of the courage, would love to do. His dealing with, whether it's the press or whether it's with another performer or his point of view. I remember that he was terribly troubled about something that someone said in the New York Times about someone. And he took an ad out yeah. and took a very strong position and put his, his character on the line. And we may not tend to remember those things, but they linger in the back of our subconscious, and they are heroes. That's what they are. We need more heroes in this world. I'm talking to you. Will you pay attention to me? I'm going to put something about him, because you right. know I worked with Frank for about a year and a half. I've never seen anybody more gracious, more charming. He loves performers. You have to be a professional. That's what he likes, like we all do, be a professional. Now, I would go out some... I opened the show for Frank. We would play sometimes for 56,000 people, 2,000, whatever it is. I've never heard such screaming and adulation for one human being. 
That's because you've never worked with me. Oh. <laughs> well, no, what I was going to say is they like Frank, too, but... <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I met Charlie... Oh, you're not going to tell this. I met Charlie Callis doing a Merv Griffin show in 1966 in New York City. I was sitting on the panel with Richard Pryor and some other guest that I don't recall. Oh. And he was introduced, and he did a routine, and that night... I leaned over to Merv Griffin and I said, I've got to use him in my film. And we were preparing to do The Big Mouth for Columbia. I wrote him into that film that night. I stayed up all night and I called Bill Richmond, who was collaborating, writing a script with me. I said, we must use this man. I've oh. never seen anybody funnier. <sighs> and he did a routine that I would love you people to see. For those of you that have seen it, you can see it a dozen more times. For those of you that haven't seen it, I must say that it's one of the best <laughs> in one comic spots you'll ever hear. Welcome Charlie Callis as he steps there to do the tag again. Alright, this um this is a story that concerns two men who are both friends. You know, when they love sports, hunting and all that. Now I have to preface this by saying that tensions being what they are today in the world, people have to get overly nervous or uptight. Such is the case with these two guys. In fact they're both a little wacko. Now, one fellow for his birthday gets a shotgun. And he calls up his friend on the phone. He wants to tell him all about it. This is what went on during and after the phone conversation. <laughs> well, hello, uh, operator. <laughs> hello, this... Uh, this... Uh, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, uh, Ralph! It's just, uh, uh, Ralph! Hey, Ralph! <laughs> Guess who this is? Yes, I mean, this is me, this is your... Uh, this is your... This, uh, this is your... Uh, this is your uh, friend, yeah. This is... This is... This is... You know what's short for... This is... Uh, uh, Sam, say, listen there, Sam. Today's my... Uh, today's my... Uh. <laughs> today's my birthday. And for my birthday, my friends, they all, they all, they all, they all, they all, they all, and you know what they, whoa, and you know what they, whoa, <laughs> and you know what they bought me? That's right, they bought me, a rice, they bought me, a rice, they bought me, a rice, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a Winchester, cut. you put it, all well, right, they bought me a shotgun, so I'll uh, listen, why don't you, why don't you jump on your car, drive up to my, huh, and drive up to my, huh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I fall over to my house. We'll go out to the country. I'm a ghost. I'm a ghost. I'm a ghost. Sh Show him. <laughs> Show what? What do I know? Sh April, May. This is a great time of year to go out and shoot some. We can go out. Shoot we can go out. Shoot you know those animals with the feet that look, look something like a moose or white? We'll shoot some birds. <laughs> So his friend, his friend at the, oh, oh, his friend at the other end says, <laughs> What you say? He says, stop fooling around, will you? Come on over. So his friend gets in the car, over to his friend's house. They get into a station wagon with a shotgun, the shells, the syringes, out into the country. There's birds flying all around, thousands of them. So anyhow, the guys who... Let me do that over again. The guy whose birthday it is, he says, hey, look. Seeing how it's my birthday and Mike and Mike and Mike and Mike and Mike. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sh just not hear you, wait. Because I'm gonna fire first. <laughs> so his friend says, <laughs> Go ahead. 
So the guy sees a whole bunch of birds. He takes his gun, a Browning Sweet 16, lets loose with a cacophony of sound. Mrs. Birds. He said, Mr. Birds, so what? <laughs> <laughs> you imagine a grown man trying to make a buck for a living. He said, Mr. Birds, so what? Oh, I sing how it is my birthday, Mike, and Mike, and Mike, and Mike, and Mike. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hit the drum with, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm going to shoot again. So his friend is very calm, cool, collected, poised, unruffled. Nothing bothers him. He says, <laughs> OK. So the guy takes the gun. The guy takes the gun again, a schmeiser this time. He misses again. Now he's disgusted. He gives the gun to his friend. He says, hey, big mouth, you wears, you wears, you wears. Why? Why that gun? <laughs> Let me see what you can do. You've been doing all the talking. So his friend takes the gun. Why do you see this? <laughs> Ninety birds fall down dead. His friend turns to me and says, Big deal, no wonder you hit the birds. You had to aim all over the damn sky. <laughs> And the import is this on? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have as our guest a young lady who is currently appearing in Las Vegas in a marvelous show, Moulin Rouge, at the Hilton Hotel. And she is really terrific. And we would like you to join us in making you feel right at home here. Miss Suzanne Summers, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> with us, Suzanne. Oh, I'm so glad you're back on television in this format. Thank you. Hi, we need you. Thank you, darling. Well, I've got some marvelous people that are helping me, so it makes it work. Yeah, but it's you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah. I've got good people with me, and uh, I think that television today needs more information about people that people are interested in. I really think that. But also they need people like you who are the pro you're the you're the pro you're you're funny and you keep the, the energy going and you're, you know it's you it's wonderful. you know what funny feels like when you're sitting with this maniac <laughs> it becomes very <laughs> difficult but it, it's a it's a grand combination because Absolutely. he sparks me and he's so <clears throat> wonderful uh, you you and I have a great deal in common I'm told and that is friends Yes. It, well, I mean, you have, you're, I, I just have in common that I'm at the Moulin Rouge, but you're Mr. Mr. Famous in France. They yeah, but you have it. something very strange. What While you unique and interesting, in France, Saint-Tropez, you spend time there. Oh. <laughs> you mean uh, the nude 
people on the beach? Well, I sure as hell don't want to hear about your skate, key. <laughs> what? Do you, do you do that when you're over on the French beaches? What? Did go nude? Yeah, yeah. I do it here in the studio. <laughs> No, I never have. <laughs> you have. No, but I'm really intrigued with it because I understand it and I respect those that enjoy doing that. Yeah. Well, they, I mean, they really, that, they take, that's just normal to them. But I, when you first go there, it's very shocking, especially as a female. I'm used to seeing uh, topless women because in the Moulin Rouge. The, as a female, I don't have to be that. I look <laughs> at them anyhow. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in the Moulin Rouge, there are, you know, 80 of them, 160 of them. <laughs> counted 161. I know her. One on the back for <laughs> right, dancing, right. I know. <laughs> right. She had the operation, though. <laughs> do, you go, do you go topless when you go to San Tropez? I'm not... I... Yes or no will suffice. <laughs> I'm getting all excited here and you're stalling. I didn't plan on it. It's just that I... I one, I finally gave in and I yeah. did. And... Um, I was lying on the beach for two weeks, and I wouldn't take my top off. I was pulling and tugging and pulling and tugging, and my husband finally said, you know, you look dumb. He said, everybody here is not without a top. He said, you're the only one. He said, you stand out more than anybody else on the whole beach. He said, why don't you take it off and just relax and join the group? So I did. And within two minutes after I was lying there, this guy walks up to me and he says, hey, how's Jack and Janet? <laughs> That's right, from my show. <laughs> You know who Jack and Janet are, don't you? <laughs> That's all this guy said? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. What right. was he, a prevert or something? <laughs> That's marvelous. I think it's terrific. When we were in Cannes for the film festival, we looked out of the suite at the Carlton Hotel, and there are consistent uh, sunbathers that are there all the time that go topless. Now, you'll see two kinds of viewer, the voyeur, of course, and then there's the other who recognizes that this is the norm and it's not such a big deal. Yeah. Well, I'm standing up on top of the suite with a long lens on one of my cameras. <laughs> so, we know, so we know who you are. No, you have to understand, I am shooting the observers. I'm oh, not looking. Sure, yeah. I would yeah. never shoot pictures of... Uh, I wouldn't want to swear to God on that stage. <laughs> But it's so funny to see the expressions. You see the young ladies walking with the sugar daddies, and there are many of them, yeah. and the sugar daddies are looking to look, but they're always on this side of the curb, and the ladies are on that side where all of the women are. And I'm getting such expressions and such pictures. We'll be back in a second with Suzanne Summers. Hang in there. We've got some Welcome back, friends. I wish all of you could have been here in the studio in that little break. We've had so many wonderful moments. And don't forget, the 700 Club is on every day. Please welcome once again the very lovely, talented, and terrific Miss Suzanne Summers, ladies and gentlemen. You can't, won't you run and decrease? 
You know what I love about your performing? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm afraid to hear. <laughs> no, I can get straight and serious. <laughs> you cannot. Yes, I can. <laughs> I'm great gonna... you are. <laughs> okay. I'm going to tell you what I love about it. You have a fantastic capacity for showmanship and pizzazz. Oh, thank you. And that's what makes a performer for me. Thank you. Thank you. Pizzazz. really nice compliment. I'm working real hard on it. I, I went out on the road four years ago and I, I, in fact, I spent two nights in my own bed last year, but it's been a real important <laughs> I'm not particularly concerned with, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> can, can we join you at any time? <laughs> What, what, what happens with you? What is this relationship they tell me about that you're having with an elephant? What is that? <laughs> I have a note here. Discuss with Suzanne her relationship with her elephant. Now, I really want to hear that. <laughs> Do you, have you ever known an elephant? Uh, Irving, Irving the elephant. I knew him very well. No, never. I ride an elephant twice a night in the in the show that I do, and uh, this elephant is really wonderful. She's so sweet and so intelligent. But you know, you probably this probably doesn't happen to you anymore. But before you perform, you know how you get butterflies in of your course. stomach, you get excited. And, well, the same things happen to an elephant. And oh. every night, right as they announce that Tanya the elephant is going out there, and I ride her, she gets all excited. And uh, she does what we would never do. She um, she breaks wind every night. <laughs> you have not lived. You have not lived. in my life. I was sorry I asked a question. <laughs> but it doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> we'll be back in a second with Suzanne Summers, Charlie Callis, Lou Brown in the orchestra, and a thousand different things that are going to happen. I can't believe it myself! Uh, we don't have a long time to go, but it gives me an opportunity to spend just a, a short, a very, very brief time to let you, the viewers, know that I just wish uh, the best wish I could ever wish you, and that was to have people in show business as your friends. Uh, it's, it's a gift, and it's something that uh, doesn't happen to a lot of people. When it happens, and you call upon those friends to assist you in an endeavor, like we are attempting here, and they're there for you. Uh, the only problem is that you do not have the capacity to expound properly on your gratitude and appreciation. Uh, I just wish that for you, because it's a wonderful frustration not to be able to thank people properly, and yet to have them with you when you need them, and to have them make you better by their presence with you. I'm in reference to the lovely people that were here tonight. Frank Sinatra, the lovely Susan Summers. Needless to say, Charlie Callis, he's, a, he's a, a national treasure as far as I'm concerned. And as far as an audience is concerned, I hope that you'll come back and we, we have the pleasure of performing for you again. You've been terrific. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> Guests of the Jerry Lou Show stated the Sheraton premiere.